Okay, let's get started. Um, today's lecture, I think, is going to be interesting, but a lot of it depends upon you people. So I've got a limited amount of materials prepared. Uh, I used some PowerPoint slides on Monday. Those slides are available on the website now, but not on the CD-ROM. There's a lot of materials that just, um, as we go along, I'm going to be posting. Um, to the, the website. Okay, so the CD basically gives you the stuff as of the week before the course. But the V materials that I post, and um, those PowerPoint slides will be there. Uh, well, they are there. And also, I've got some slides for today uh, that I also posted. Um, virtual students, um, it's, uh, I emailed all of these PowerPoint slides to you. Um, and it's probably best that you um, print those out now um, because it's hard to see. I know that some of you on, on the, um, the archive version that you've looked at, uh, sometimes the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint slides are a little fuzzy. But uh, today actually should be a little clearer. Okay, do we have uh, any questions? You, you are getting my emails. I'm not using a bulletin board, I'm just using blanket email. Uh, some people have asked a question about some of the data files. Um, there's a bunch of short forms, um, and it's not clear what they actually mean. I will send an email out uh, either later today or, or tomorrow uh, with the definition of those codes. Most of them are, are straightforward, like um, TR is total return, PE, price to earnings. Uh, but some of them are not as clear. So I'll put the full list in, put those. Most of you should probably be using the MSCI file that I recommended to get uh, going on assignment number two. And that's pretty complete and it's very uh, intuitive what the, what the um, data series actually are. Okay? Um, a number of uh, virtual students have uh, joined the, the webcast. Um, they can actually join at any time. Uh, they don't need to watch it live, but we have New students today from uh, Fidelity, uh, Mellon Capital, uh, Bearings Asset Management, uh, uh, First Union, uh, Arrow Street, um, and the list uh, basically uh, continues to grow. So that's kind of exciting. And uh, hopefully we'll have you know, some sort of interaction with these students. Okay, well what I want to do today is to talk about, uh, and actually, the description of, of today's lecture is brainstorm. You know, what the future is actually going to look like. And um, actually, before I, I, I do that, um, we do have um, extra CD-ROMs. If you haven't got a CD-ROM, um, you can see Carol. Um, or if you haven't paid for the CD-ROM, see Carol. And she's uh, located, she's right, right there. Uh, but she's just outside my office in the fourth floor west. Okay, um, it, it's an incredibly difficult problem to kind of figure out what the future landscape of asset management is going to look like. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give um, some PowerPoint <coughs> slides. It's a very general presentation about technology and finance in the future. And then what I hope to do is to have a discussion with you to get your ideas of what might happen. And then after the break, um, we can continue that and I'll have a, a specific um, presentation of an idea um, that isn't operational yet, but an idea that I think is very exciting um, that has to do with the trading um, over the counter and how the internet might affect that. And indeed, I sent an email to people that, uh, who have uh, FX trading uh, experience and maybe at the break if you could come down and we could talk a little bit so I could brief you as to some of the things I'll, I'll say after the break. Okay, so let me let me start by um, talking about technology in general. I guess I'm uh, interested in this. To me, one of the most important um, attributes in success in asset management and actually in any type of business is vision. 
And this is something that you really, uh, it's difficult to teach. Given that you're, you're sitting here or watching, the odds are that you probably um, are well endowed with that uh, particular attribute. Okay, but it's not something that I can actually teach. It's something you need to value. It's also the case that the person with vision is not necessarily the best manager. So sometimes you have to take some people with vision and put them with a group where they can actually make the vision work. Okay. The other thing uh, with vision is that it's like forecasting a stock return. It's extremely difficult to do. And you can be wrong sometimes. But one thing that I think I've learned um, and many businesses have learned that if you're really going to win, you have to start taking some risks. And if you look at the strategies of a number of firms that have been winners um, utilizing the, the internet, they went early and they went with a product that wasn't the best possible product. Like you could always listen to your, um, your infrastructure and coding people saying, well, we need you know, another six months to, to repolish this product. What you have to do is just go for it and change it on the fly. And you have to have good diagnostics so you can actually tell um, what the strengths are and the weaknesses on the fly. And you have to have speed. Speed is, a, is very important also. To be able to change quickly with minimum uh, bureaucratic uh, pressures. Okay, so let me just kind of set the stage in general. And some of you might have seen some of this material um, here and there. Uh, actually, um, some of the material I drew from this book um, by Ray Kurzweil, um, Spiritual Machine or something like that. Anybody read that book? Yeah, he's a very interesting guy um, and uh, what I consider a visionary. And the other thing that's kind of important is, uh, is a sense of history. Because we're talking about um, forecasting, it's always useful to look at the past to see <coughs> what we've actually um, learned and try to apply that to the future. So you can see elements of this uh, in this uh, presentation. So um, I'm going to um, basically evaluate technological change. It happens all the time, but um, what does it actually mean? And what we're going to do is forecast. There's one thing to say, oh, well, you know, the internet uh, has caused a lot of structural uh, change in the economy. Uh, everybody's got a, a, a PC now, but, you know, what does that mean and can we forecast with any accuracy uh, into the future? This is the course <coughs> that is really a forecasting course. Okay, indeed, um, one of the, the main differences between finance and accounting um, is this forecasting ability, where much of accounting, not all of accounting, but much of accounting is to really figure out and understand where the firm stands now. And you use all sorts of fundamental information to actually do that. And a lot of finance, what it deals with is the future. So the value of the stock is the discounted <coughs> cash flows that are expected in the market. So it is very forward-looking. And we're going to try to forecast um, in terms of uh, technological change. What does it mean for the corporation in general? And I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of uh, this focus on uh, micros microscopic markets and how it's feasible now. And uh, one thing that's, uh, that's very um, interesting to me uh, is kind of the growth of, of barter in our economy. So that's kind of the plan. Um, You've seen these quotations before. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let me just like read them and then uh, make a comment on all of them. Um, so Jack Welsh um, asked about e-business, and he thinks we're in the first in it. Okay. Um, uh, Scott McNeely, we are 0.5 percent into e-commerce revolution. This has just started. Okay. Um, it will have implications for the nation state, for the ways we organize around the world. Okay? And finally, distance has been eliminated 
there is only one economy and one market. Now, <coughs> these are very distinguished people making these quotations, but if you really think about it, um, it seems kind of obvious. You know, we're in the first inning. That kind of implies there's nine innings, and I'm not sure things don't end, right? We're at the beginning of, of something that's true, but this really just happens all the time. And what's important for us is to be able to forecast ahead. And often with visionary, um, we need to forecast ahead in the longer term. So in finance, a lot of the longer term is like three to five years. Right? I'm pushing you to 10 years in assignment number two. And that's a long term. But I'm going to try to think out 20 years. So hopefully by 20 years, you'll be able to retire. OK, that's the goal, maybe. Uh, have enough. Um, so let's, uh, the implications here. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, the implications of just pure computer speed. We talk about the, the internet a lot, but the other thing that's really going on is it's just the speed has increased uh, dramatically uh, to do computing. And the speed is actually exponentially increasing. And, and what does that mean? So if we actually go through and, and take a look at the actual logic, and we have to do this for, for actual <laughs> forecasting. So we have to understand what's going on to be able to forecast out, let's say, 20 years. So there's basically um, two factors going on. There's a shorter distance. Um, for electrons to travel between transistors as the chips get thinner. And also you're putting more transistors on the chip. Okay? And there's a, a science to this, and there are you know, reliable forecasts as to how far you can actually go in doing that. And you can extrapolate out um, with a fair bit of accuracy what's going to happen in terms of the speed. So those are uh, growth factors. There's other things that could happen that make it even faster. So, um, for example, there could be um, you know, parallel processing going on at, at the same time. And that could make things even faster. And really what I want to build is kind of a baseline, even a conservative forecast of what we're talking about in terms of computer speed. And uh, the analysis that I'm going to present uh, is conservative. And it's conservative in, in actually uh, presenting an exponential growth uh, scenario. So ignore the uh, parallel processing. You get exponential. If you factor in parallel processing, then you get exponential of an exponential. So I want to be conservative. And you're going to see in the forecast that I think uh, it is pretty conservative. Now, what I want to compare it to is the brain. And there's actually a fair bit of research on the brain. And I want to use the brain as a benchmark for technology. So uh, the scientific research suggests there's about 100 billion neurons in the average brain. And there's about 1,000 connections between each neuron. So you put that together, and you get 100 trillion connections, um, each capable of a simultaneous calculation. Brain's obviously incredibly powerful. Now, the, uh, the advantage uh, to the brain is that it's massively parallel. And this is the reason that it does um, really a great job at pattern recognition that we can see <coughs> incredibly clearly. And, and, that, and, and that is all parallel processing. But it turns out that it's really slow on kind of like the raw calculation part of it. So, you know, you can show me a page of numbers and I can look at it, and it's going to take me a long time to add those numbers up. But we, even with today's computers, it's instant calculation. So, so there's strengths and there's weaknesses. And you have to factor both of these into uh, account and actually figuring out what the processing power is of the brain. Okay, so 
we can uh, figure out that at 200 calculations per second and 100 trillion connections implies 20 million billion connection <coughs> calculations per second. Okay, so 20 million billion, that's where we are right now. And what we got in terms of computing power today, modestly, is 2 billion. Okay, so it's the difference we're talking about between 2 billion and 20 million billion. Okay, so, so right now computers are really not that powerful compared to our brain. Brain's really got. So let's do this exercise in forecasting. Yeah, virtual students, this is an asset management course. Don't, don't tune out. Uh, so this guy, uh, Ray Kurzweil, actually did a lot of work in looking historically at uh, the history of computers and actually figured out um, the calculations per second per $1,000 through history. And of course, the best data is the most recent data, like from 1980. And you can see that there's an exponential curve uh, in, the, in the orange. And notice also the scale on the left-hand side is not your usual scale. So that's where you see the, the exponential of the exponential effectively if we had the regular linear scale. And what I've done is just basically <laughs> extrapolate it out with a straight line, which in the log scale means exponential. Okay, so simple, actually, it actually looks like a pretty good fit, right? If we had data like this, we'd be reasonably confident. Um, and, and indeed, even though there are no circles um, by the, uh, the blue line, we kind of know the stuff that Intel has announced already, right? We kind of know what they're working on. We know for Pentium 4 what the capability is. Okay, so we actually, um, and, and they're not going to make statements about Pentium 4 that they really can't support. I think it's unlikely. So some of those dots actually carry out to the blue line and indeed um, go above the blue line. But let's be conservative uh, on this. So that first level is the insect brain. Okay, And we're, uh, we're, we're there. Right? Our computers are <coughs> powerful as an in insect's brain. And then the mouse brain, we got a while to go. Uh, it, it's amazing, right? You think of how powerful our computers are, yet they're not quite at a mouse's brain. It really puts things in perspective. And what else do we have? Human brain. Okay, so um, you can kind of like read off this graph as to when the expected time that we're going to have a computer <coughs> for $1,000 that's going to have the power of the human brain. And this conservative forecast suggests 2025. And that's for $1,000. We're not talking about um, the supercomputer uh, situation where you spend millions of dollars on a, a very large computer. We'll have computers like that that you know, potentially rival the human brain before 2025. This you know, is not that far away. Like I know it seems like a long way, but it's not that far away. <coughs> and uh, do I have another one here? Oh, yes. Anybody guess what this is going to be? The world. All the brains together, if you put them together for $1,000. So, so this to me really kind of, that's the setting for me. That um, what we're faced with is in not that long of a term, you know, for $1,000 in 2025, we get something as powerful as our brain. Uh, and before that, we're going to have companies that have computers that are as powerful or more powerful than the brain. Okay. 
Now, um, I also go on in, um, well, actually, Kurzweil uh, <coughs> takes it out to 2060, where you've got one trillion human uh, brains uh, for $1,000. Okay, so, um, we go through the same exercise with memory. And I'm not going to go through all the details. But you can do the same thing with memory. So how long will it take, given the current technology, some extrapolation, to get the memory of the human brain for $1,000? And it turns out that um, about 2020. And again, there's a lot of scientific evidence that uh, would support the analysis of how much memory we've got right now and, um, and then the forecast going forward. So it's not just raw computing power, it's also memory. And actually, I was quite surprised at how much memory uh, the brain uh, actually uh, contains. So, so what does this mean? Like in, in a way, it's, uh, it's kind of like awesome. Uh, I don't want to call it a fact. I almost did. It's a forecast. Forecast can be wrong. But you know, given what we know, it seems that that's a reasonable forecast. The Kurzweil book is interesting because he actually takes it a step further because he argues that if we've got a computer with all the capabilities of a human brain, he actually you know, wonders at least whether it's possible for a computer to have spirituality. You have to read the book to, to appreciate the argument. It's a scientific argument. Um, but it really you know, forces you to think, what is going on here? Where I've got in my kitchen something that is more powerful than, than my brain. In all aspects. It's not a matter of just doing some calculations. So, um, so what does this mean like, for the corporation? And again, we have to look at uh, history um, for this uh, to make uh, sense. Um, and uh, there's some really interesting um, kind of historical research on the evolution of corporations. Indeed, some of this might be taught here. I'm not sure. I should talk to my fellow faculty members. Um, uh, I, I just got a very interesting book on like, the history of the corporation from Greek times to, to modern times. And, it's, it's a very interesting science um, to actually study this. And, 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 as, and it might seem odd that you're studying the history of the corporation. Like, who really cares about what was happening in the Middle Ages with the corporation? And the whole thing is that you need to understand the forces that caused the corporation to come together. And then you can actually look at the environment today and figure out where it's going to go. So like, vision is not just the ability to imagine or guess. I think good vision is based in solid analysis. So you take a look at what's happened and the forces that affect corporations. And then you make an extrapolation. And let's call that vision. So it turns out that um, in the 19th century, um, the main reason that corporations came together was to, um, to minimize transactions costs. There was really transaction cost driven. <coughs> and this is a theory of the corporation by, um, uh, by Coase, a famous economist at Chicago. Um, now, to me, my kind of view is that transactions costs are, are decreasing today. So while that might have been true um, in the 19th century and most of the 20th century, the transactions costs, the, the, like the reasons, some of the reasons that these corporations became large and powerful are kind of um, going away. So um, and we've even seen um, things like centralized control, um, being diminished and, and more modular uh, type of control in corporations. The forces are actually uh, <coughs> happening uh, today. And uh, we've seen spin-offs where um, corporations just, there's no reason to be so large. There's no reason to have a, a conglomerate situation. And there's more focus uh, 
and, and I think that part of this is due to uh, transactions costs. Um, now, what about the consumer level? Okay, because we're talking, we'll be you know, focusing on asset management, but um, we have to think not just of the asset management firm, but of the consumer as well. So the consumer today has access to a huge amount of information. And there's more competition, um, and it seems like you're going to get better value if you've got more competition and more information. And there's some exceptions, of course, because there's some industries that are maybe less competitive because they're so concentrated. Um, and we've kind of seen through history um, this, this evolution from, and you might have done this in a marketing course, where there's like mass marketing, then you go to segments, and what do we have today? It's like they got your profile. You're like, <coughs> you, you call a company, right? And they got the call ID right there, and your file comes right up, your history of purchases and, and all these details. They will ask who it is, but they know in most cases. And it's just their protocol that they have to ask because um, it might cause you to, uh, to put call block on, on your telephone if you knew when somebody picked up the phone, they saw your whole profile. So we've got the ability now, you know, and especially with more and more broadband, um, to consider the market as the individual. Okay, and I want to, you know, that's going to be a real important thought um, in terms of asset management. Okay, so traditionally, um, you're kind of buying into um, maybe a mutual fund or an index fund or, or, or something like that. It, and you're kind of like grouped with a bunch of people. It's not really catered um, directly to you. There's some exceptions. But we've seen a dramatic growth of kind of like um, <coughs> investment management that is styled to specifically suit the consumer. And the consumer is not necessarily one of us, but it could be an institutional investor also. OK, what about finance? In my opinion, stock exchanges as we know them are going to disappear. Re come on, let's, let's think hard about this. Um, the floor of the NYSE, you know, it's something from um, the 19th century. It doesn't make any sense, people running around. Or the pit in Chicago where the futures are traded, people shouting and, and, and trading. There's no way, that's gone. It's going to be gone. I wouldn't recommend a floor trader as a, as a career path right now. Okay, or, or if you do it, make sure it's short term to gain the experience, because it's just not going to be there. Okay. Just the same way that I don't recollect, or you know, I think I said this last time, uh, the financial, the traditional financial analyst is studying a particular firm. We've got quantitative models right now that can do the job of thousands of, of financial analysts. It's not the sort of job that um, is going to be sustainable in the future. So if you accepted a job like that, fine. But <laughs> yeah, we know that uh, your average uh, span on the job after graduating here is uh, 18 months, right? So uh, you need to be thinking ahead. Okay, not just for asset management, for your uh, career also. Trading is going to be computer against computer. <coughs> it's going to be, the markets are going to be much more efficient. It's going to be computer program trading against computer program. <coughs> Indeed, uh, later on in the course, I forget what lecture, uh, where we do high frequency trading, I'll talk about a program. Program that, um, that I've got running uh, with uh, some partners that is incredibly sophisticated, um, that does battle uh, with the supposedly most efficient markets in the world, T-bond futures and foreign currency. Okay, and, and basically, uh, in the future, it's going to be my model and my partner's model versus somebody else's model. 
and that's what it's going to be. The, the people down on the floor taking a bet here or there, just not going to work because we can process a massive amount of information very quickly and and win on average. Yes. So where do you think volume is headed? I mean, if all these computers can rapidly trade. You've got to think volume is going to exponentially increase on the exchange. Increase or or, or decrease? Um, if you, in the model you said you have going. If yeah. Trading See, the problem is that once people realize that you're trading against uh, the model. Uh, they might not want to trade. So you have to be really uh, devious the way that you do it. So you, you, you farm out your trades. Well, you probably all know this. You farm out your trades to many different uh, uh, organizations and then farm out some trades that go the other direction to knowing you're going to be a loser. Just to confuse. And you randomly do that. So, uh, you know, why does trading volume occur? It occurs because there's disagreement. That's usually the case. There's also liquidity trading where you just need some money, so you go into the market and, and sell. And there's no information basis whatsoever. Um, uh, but most of the, the trading, I think, would be characterized as information trading, where you actually think that this stock is a good buy, so you go in and, and do that. But if, if you're an individual and you face the specter of, of trading against um, my VA Linux array with 64 processors running massively parallel. Um, you know, that's a little scary. So, uh, <coughs> so I think that it's not clear what's going to happen to volume. Not clear at all. But there's still lots of way to go, okay? So there's lots of opportunity right now. Remember, our forecast is 20 years. Um, and I think that uh, the, stock, the traditional stock exchange will go and probably and it's going to be purely electronic. And the traditional futures market also. That's, that's about as much as we've got. Yes? Well, taking your example, <coughs> even today I'm sure there's asset management firms running all these uh, uh, numerical models. And yes. I'm assuming, looking at the results, most of them are not able to beat uh, the indexes. So is there any particular reason why? That's not clear, first. Um, and. Often you just don't hear about it if they've got something really good. And, uh, and often these are hedge funds because if you've really got something good, you've got to be in a hedge fund because that's where you're going to get the upside. And the hedge fund, if they've really got something good, you can't invest with them, right? It's closed. You know, indeed, they made so much money that they don't need any clients. <coughs> and they don't want to get too large, too greedy. Because when you get really large, uh, you impact the market. So it's not so easy to, to lay on a leg of uh, T-bond futures trades with like 20,000 contracts a leg. It's, it's impossible. You know, have a massive shift in the market. So, so there is uh, limitations here. But yeah, I think that um, we talked a little bit uh, uh, before the class um, to a group that was going to look at performance uh, evaluation. And yeah, a lot of you just don't see. Okay. Um, yeah, so computer against computer. And the role for humans uh, is, uh, I guess, in designing the code. But um, you know, a lot of this is you know, standard material. Um, and you've all probably heard of like neural networks and, and things like that. And often they don't work. You can pull off neural network off the, uh, the internet, um, some software for $50. Actually had uh, a, a project one year for assignment number one where they ran a simple uh, neural net. For $50, you get about 50 bucks of value. Right? It's incredibly simplistic representation. It's running on some PC. It, it's not going to work. You don't have a chance. But as you get more layers, uh, more complexity, these methodologies have some chance of winning. I wouldn't necessarily put my money on the neural net kind of technology in general, um, but uh, because it's a little too restrictive. But we'll talk more about that when we talk about high frequency uh, trading. Okay, um, currency. We're going to talk about currency in the second half uh, in in some detail. But um, seems to me that 
there's going to be more and more barter <coughs> where companies are going to be doing a, a lot more B2B and they're going to directly barter the goods rather than having money as the, uh, as the basis of the transaction. There's always going to be some sort of unit of, of account, but it doesn't have to be a dollar. It could be anything. It doesn't really matter. It could be zinc. But if you think about this as, um, you know, money was there because one of the reasons that currency actually evolved was that it was extremely difficult to operate in a barter economy. You go to the market, you gotta carry all the things you're gonna trade for some other stuff. They said, well, forget that. Let's have some sort of currency, and that's gonna be a lot easier to deal. But now, with these B2B uh, capabilities, that you could be trading your goods directly. There's no cash flow necessary. So, um, so we'll have a, a unit of account but the actual, um, the actual <coughs> currency is, is in question. And this is, again, you know, like we're talking, uh, I believe, like 10 years uh, for this one. We've seen some of this today. We're going to see a bit of growth in barter. And uh, it's actually going to be pretty rapid growth. But for this to actually take a big bite out of currency is going to take a while. Um, and uh, I, in the second bullet point, I, I say, um, a lot of what people in finance do um, is working capital management. Indeed, uh, before I joined the school, uh, Fuqua was really well known for its finance program. And the finance program was focused on basically working capital management, cash management. And shortly after I joined, kind of like had a turnover in the department. And all of a sudden, it was completely different. But it used to be this was the place to go for you know, lockbox theory and, and <coughs> stuff like that. Linear programming and cash management, working capital management. Well, if you really think about this barter thing, um, it could eliminate the needs um, or the acute needs for some corporations in terms of uh, working capital. Indeed, there could be forward barter transactions, B2B. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. Um, also, debt. The debt doesn't have to be in dollars or whatever currency. And we've seen some of that today where some, um, some countries especially have put their debt uh, in, in oil or some other unit. But there's no reason that we can't have debt in, in some other unit of account. And this is going to be something I, I think that uh, there's lots of possibilities here. So you bypass the traditional, um, the traditional uh, debt markets. Um, global finance, I, I really think that uh, currency uh, is going to become less important over the longer term. Uh, basically, uh, we're going to see three currency zones if we already don't see it right now. Um, and that will probably evolve to one currency. You know, I, I, I really think that, that that's the direction that we're heading. So more people will join the Eurozone, there'll be a yen zone, a uh, dollar, and then eventually there'll be something to put everything together. Okay, well, that's pretty dramatic um, because if that's the case, then um, things like currency hedging, all that time you spent uh, in investment and, and 350 talking about hedging of currencies and, and things like that. Well, if it's one currency, it's not an issue. Right? Or if there's a large zone that you happen to do your business in, then it's not going to be uh, that big of an issue. Effectively, um, what we're doing is taking out a risk factor when we do this. Okay, um, that's kind of uh, everything that I've got um, in terms of uh, the future. And I, I think that one of the things that uh, strikes me the most is just this idea of barter uh, and the focus on, on individual units. I think that's, this is going to be a huge growth uh, in barter. Um, 
I was, uh, I was very lucky to, over the summer, um, and actually I didn't even know this was happening, it was kind of embarrassing. I was giving a, a talk in Whistler, British Columbia, and uh, you go to Vancouver and you have to drive two hours. How many have been to Whistler? Yeah, it's a great place. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the organization that was sponsoring it, uh, they said, oh, we'll have a float plan for you. So well, that's kind of cool. Um, so I did that. And when I got there, I met by a suit and a stretch. And uh, they said, oh, there's this, uh, this, uh, this other guy is going with us, too. Uh, and I see this person. Um, he looked a little ragged, to say the least, uh, with a huge amount of luggage. Um, and uh, so I said, OK. So we kind of limoed over to the, uh, the float plane terminal. And the float plane wasn't there yet. So this person says, yeah, let's go have a beer. And I said, OK. Um, and then he explained that he just got off multiple flights from Italy. Um, but he, he actually was based in the US. So, okay, I didn't know he was connected to this conference I was going to. No idea whatsoever. Uh, and we started talking, and uh, then I kind of figured out that he was an economist, you know, and there's lots of economists. And uh, maybe, maybe even a retired economist because he's in Italy half the year. And we started talking and talking and started, he was asking me a lot of questions. And I was getting a little bit suspicious. And then we're kind of going through all my travels and I said I'd spend a lot of time in, um, in Sweden and Finland uh, teaching and stuff like that. And then he said, yeah, I was recently um, in Sweden. Then my heart starts going. Um, and then I start thinking, Sweden, economist, uh, Nobel Prize. And it was Bob Mundell, the 1999 Nobel laureate. I'm sitting there, I almost spit my beer out. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and it, you know, he won the prize. Uh, well, one of the reasons was that he is the research force behind the idea of uh, currency union in Europe. And we had just an incredibly interesting conversation, especially after his first beer. Um, and, and, and I started asking him, you know, what about this barter? Because this is a guy that's a visionary. He's not just a great economist, but he's a visionary. Uh, what about barter? You know, because it, you know, I was very interested in that. Um, and he got talking, and he said that he thought it was just incredibly hot. Uh, and then he said, indeed, um, Part of the reason I'm coming out here is not just to be the keynote speaker at your conference, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've got a board of directors meeting for barter.com. So he's like really into this uh, big time. So I think that this is going to be like a real uh, growth area, B2 <coughs> um, sort of um, barter stuff. So, um, OK, so let's, let's talk uh, a little bit um, about, uh, about kind of the asset management uh, landscape and, and talk a little bit about kind of the short-term changes and the longer-term changes. Question? I just wonder what are the major um, economic or uh, financial advantages of barter transaction over the currency setting? Um, well, you know, I, I, I think that a lot of the time you actually need to finance your transactions, right? And you could have a B2B type of market where you kind of put the buyer and seller together of the actual goods and you reduce the transaction's costs as a result of that. So you, you completely cut out the middle people, you completely cut out the need for financing, and you put the, the basic, uh, the person that wants the input and the person that sells the input directly together. That, that, that is incredibly powerful. And you say, well, what about shipping costs? Well, you have to ship anyways. So there's always costs like that. And there's always uh, kind of a settlement uh, costs. There's always there. Well, you're basically removing the spread by putting people directly together. That is the power of B2B. Indeed, in the second half, I'm going to talk about a B2B application. And, and that is basically its genesis, that you rip the spread away and you make the market way more efficient. 
So it is, you know, I think uh, a reasonable idea. Uh, you don't need to do um, barter for B2B. You know what I mean? You, you could be settling in dollars. That, that's fine. But there could be a situation where you completely avoid that and just trade the goods. And that's it. Yes? I'm curious about something you said. You mentioned before that uh, the incentive for transaction is really discrepancy in information. How information it's part of the incentive. There's two reasons, as I said, to trade. Right. One reason is liquidity, the other reason is information. Liquidity side, you just focus on the difference in information. I'm not, I'm not really sure how to think this through, but assuming 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, where computers are infinitely smarter, infinitely more capable than we are, and they're all making a transaction, ultimately, if they really are smart, smart the, uh, the difference in, in interpretation of information is going to be eliminated. So what happens to trading? Well, think about it. Um, if we com we, we've got uh, a security, okay, IBM, and we completely agree um, about the distribution of possible payoffs in the future, complete agreement, There's, we're not going to trade. Because if both of us are holding it, we're holding it for a reason. <coughs> One's not going to be buying and the other's selling. So as the, as the information uh, asymmetry <coughs> shrinks, then in terms of the information motivation for trading, it, it decreases. Now, the other thing that we need to be careful of here is that um, it's going to be a while before there's complete agreement, right? And there could be a small amount of disagreement and, um, and no trading because the transactions costs are too high, right? So I think IBM's worth, um, what's the current price of IBM? Nobody knows. One hundred dollars? One oh nine. Okay. So I think it's worth uh, one oh nine and twenty five cents, and you think it's worth one oh nine and twenty cents. So we're real close. Okay. And that five cents is not going to be enough uh, for us to kind of trade because the transactions costs are so high. But as the the information, you know, is becoming more and more common, there's other forces out there. So the transactions costs are also decreasing. <laughs> so I think it's gonna be a while before we see the actual, you know, really serious, um, you know, limiting of the actual uh, trading activity. But hypothetically, if you, reach, if you reach a point where you yes. and I completely disagree on information, right. trading will only take place for liquidity. Liquid. That's exactly right. That's what the theory suggests. And the theory makes sense if everybody agrees. I think it's a while before everybody agrees. Yes? But what about all the different types of uncertainties that you're facing in this world today? Yeah, I know. This, you know. this is a scenario of the future, right, where basically all these computer models are taking all of these uncertainties, dynamically looking at them nonlinearly, uh, looking at all possible Monte Carlo paths, um, solving a dynamic program, and coming up with the same answer. I think it, that's a long way off. So I think there's lots of room to, to make money uh, in the next 20 years because transactions costs will decrease and it's gonna be, even though we've got these you know, brain-like computers, we all know that our brains, you know, we disagree ourselves, right? So depending upon the program inputs, um, there could be some, some differences. Yes? That's true, um, and, the, and, and that, like in a way, is a market imperfection um, because there's no alternative, <coughs> right? There, there's not real competition there for that particular type of house, so I can't go to somebody else. And yeah, th there's going to be um, uh, imperfections like that, and you know, certain large goods. Oh, oh, that's the same thing as a liquidity trader. So the liquidity trader uh, either needs the money or has got the money and is going to invest it. So you're not, there's no particular information going on. You just, well, I need to put this into equities, and that's it. Okay. But you know, think about the equities themselves. You know, like 
why is it that the company is issuing stock to the market? Like, does that make sense in the future? Like, do we have to issue the stock to the market as a whole? Like, this one thing is traded on the exchange. You know, or, or can we identify particular consumers and, um, and target them with some other product? It might not even look like equity. It might look like um, you give us some capital, which we need to build a new plant, um, and we'll pay you off in, in goods. And you can transact uh, using some <coughs> sort of um, some sort of a reverse auction like system. That there's other people like you that could be uh, wanting to get rid of that particular asset um, and we'll put them together with some sort of internet framework. So, you know, um, you look at these markets. The IPO market, I think, is a classic. You know, the, the investment banks take the 7% spread, the huge spread, and everybody does it. And somebody's going to come in, somebody already has come in, and say, well, this doesn't make any sense. We can go and undercut this substantially, have something that's internet based. Okay. Yes? Well, but then you're, you're, you're discounting the widespread factor of human greed, saying that people will forsake maybe more, more <coughs> selfish needs of accumulating more and more to come out in a more equilibrium. No, that's not what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is that somebody, you know, let's say there's, uh, you know, five main firms that are doing all the IPOs, right? They're making a lot of dough. It's clear. It's a good, uh, it's a good business. And everybody's charging the same spread, which is remarkable. 6.9, 7, 7.1. Lots of research on this, okay? Uh, and somebody's going to come in and say, well, uh, I don't think this is sustainable. This is like a game theory problem. This is not sustainable. So I'm going to go challenge the model. Okay? And you know, maybe it's true that if I just go in and start charging seven, uh, I'm going to make some money in the short term, and that's going to be good for me. But that's not sustainable in the long term. So I'm going to, I'm going to be the challenger, and I'm going to go in and actually do this. And there are some examples that are, are different where you know, a great example is um, kind of the, uh, the recording industry, where no particular unit was willing to actually go in and do what Napster did. Okay? And I think <coughs> that that's very short-sighted on their part. Because now there's a challenger. Now, who knows what's going to happen legally? But it's the idea that somebody small, a startup, basically, could come in and basically uh, upend that entire industry. And those people are scared. So I believe that it's better to actually make the move first. That's better for um, long-term shareholder value. It not, might not be great for the short term, because you'd be taking a loss initially, and people would be very upset with you and try to fight you like crazy. Okay. Does that make sense? But what about um, the question, hey, Jim? I was going to ask a question about the, the barter scenario. Um, would that, if we move to uh, fully barter without the need for currencies and so forth, and really you don't need central banks anymore, what is, that, what is the implication of that for inflation? Do you, does that mean that inflation will be minimized or possibly we, not, we might not have inflation anymore? And hyperinflation would, would definitely not be in the game, right? Well, uh, actually it might not be in the game before the barter system. Because if we go to these currency zones, effectively, you know, one of the main issues in going to a Eurozone was that you basically eliminate the control of the, the local central bank. The central bank cannot pursue um, uh, an inflationary policy of printing money. It's just impossible if you've got a European central bank. You know, they could do that, but the countries lose control of their monetary policy, and that's the big cost of a union, where you give up some, some degree of your sovereignty. So the question, I think, is going to be answered before we actually go to barter. But it's certainly the case, even with these currency zones, that there could be inflationary policies. So the US could start printing money. Uh, hopefully, it's unlikely. Um, but 
they could do that. Other um, central banks could actually do that. It could be inflationary pressures. Um, but uh, you're exactly right. If you go to 100% barter, then inflation as we kind of know it as monetary inflation uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. And we could sidetrack a long time on what inflation actually is. When we see this increase in the CPI, yet you know um, the price of the, the, the comp what you're getting for the same price of the computer is just so dramatically increasing in value. So there's a lot of issues in terms of calculation of, uh, of price levels. But you can see it before, um, before the barter economy. And remember, the barter economy could retain the unit of account as the, as the dollar or, or whatever. Or it might have something else. Now, do you think the, uh, uh, this natural progression, do you think political entities like central banks and governments would be willing to relinquish this sovereignty? Or uh, is there, do they have no choice in the matter? Or are we just kind of moving in that direction as a natural consequence? I, I think if you look at what happened, and probably you, you study this in macro, hopefully you have, because it's really, I think, um, there's many things you do in macro that you really can't apply to a corporate environment. But what happened with uh, the Eurozone, I think, is, is, is really a purely competitive thing, where they realize that you know, if, you don't, if I don't join, then it, it's going to really take a, a hit on my country's ability to compete in the future. Because within that zone, we have reduced a lot of transactions costs. Okay? And it is true that we have given up um, sovereignty over our monetary policy. But in a number of countries, that's a good move. And corporations especially appreciate that. Corporations don't like inflation, right? You know, with some exceptions. Uh, if it's commodity driven, um, oil companies uh, maybe like it. But, um, you know, you give that control up, and that's maybe a good thing. Okay? For business, you like to reduce uncertainty, stuff that you can't control. So you have to do all this hedging stuff. It's very hard sometimes to hedge inflation. There are some vehicles where you can do that. But if you eliminate the inflation, then it just reduces the cost of doing business. Yes? Yeah. Look at the scenario where we are just exchanging goods for the good. Basically, one of the advantages of the currency is that I don't necessarily need to have something that my partner needs to engage in a transaction with him. Yes. If currency disappears or lose its value, then I'm going to be the prisoner of a game where I have to always predict what the other, the other person is going to want so that I can acquire it, so that I can trade with this person. So maybe a computer is going to do that for me, but I'm going to lose control on my asset and the way I manage my assets. You, it, it's simply, it's going to be as simple as on the screen you say, I need X and I'm willing to pay Y. And, um, and somebody else, and multiple people are saying, um, I want to sell X, and this is what I want. And you're going to see it and just put it together. So I'm, what I'm not talking about is trying to hunt around to try to find uh, the person to do barter with. It's going to be completely transparent on yes, the internet. There's going to be a transaction cost associated with that. So yes. So necessarily. There could be a unit, <coughs> and that's where a unit of account comes in. So there could be a unit of account to actually do that. But you actually don't need that unit to do the transaction. So we could have everything quoted in the price of zinc, which is often used in these examples. People want to avoid gold for some reason. But it doesn't matter what, what the unit is. So yeah, so that would facilitate the actual trading to see that unit. And then <coughs> these things are just exchanged. And that's it. It's done. That's exactly what you want. You want to deal with the original person. The currency by a unit that is what it, it's a unit. It might still exist, but it's just a unit of account. Remember, currency's got a number of different um, values, right? Yes. Just to build on uh, what Pierre had just said, uh, if if one day we wake up and there's no more currencies and we have just these units to calculate the uh, uh, to facilitate the transactions, quarter transactions, then uh, we'll also have no capital. And then uh, people's wealth will be measured not not the uh, numbers of on their accounts, but in the form of, I don't know, maybe claims or some claims against the property or some rights or whatever. And is that what you are saying? I, I doubt that people will will be willing to uh, 
to measure their wealth. Like a person retires and his his wealth is just the, the, the claim over this two piece of property. Really? What you know, so you've got like stock. What's the real difference? That's the capital. It's a claim. It. It's a claim on the uh, cash flows. Yeah. Or yeah. so or or well the cash flows come from the product of the firm. So it could be a claim on the product of the firm. Like I don't want to give you the impression that I think that the currency will 100% go away. I think there's still a role for the unit of account. It's just going to look a lot different. And it might be that people actually measure their wealth um, not just by the capital, but by these claims, which are highly liquid. We'll have a market uh, that you know you can trade those claims for whatever you need. It's a possibility. Now again, you know, uh, I don't expect 100% uh, agreement because we're talking about the future. But it's so useful to kind of like think forward. You rarely get the opportunity to actually do this. I was uh, once invited um, <coughs> to um, to talk at basically a brainstorming session on asset management in Boston, and people just came into the room and just brainstormed what would happen uh, in terms of asset management. And um, one of the things that uh, I suggested, which I thought was really cool, we have to go to a break in a couple of minutes, was that there's a lot of firms out there that uh, provide excellent products in terms of asset management, but they only focus on institutional investors. That it's too costly to go for kind of the small client base, like, a, like an individual investor. So they focus at the institutional level. And I saw no reason with transactions cost decreasing, with the internet and things like that, that you could have a business that purely focuses on institutional investors that could offer the same type of product that a particular institutional investor would invest in to a consumer. Now, the institutional investor has got a whole uh, crew of, of people doing due diligence on the investment strategy. As an individual investor, I don't have that ability. I've got my job to do and whatever else, and I don't have the ability to spend a lot of time on due diligence of a particular investment strategy. So why can't I simply say, I want to pursue the global investment strategy of CalPERS, and that's it. <coughs> and then I'm actually placed within the same pool. The same sort of trading rules are used for my account. So this firm that catered to institutional investors could massively expand um, its investor base with um, actually low transactions costs. So the reason that they weren't doing directly to individual investors was the cost. They don't want to have to deal with the phone calls and the uh, client meeting and stuff like that. They focus on the larger firms. But now, and this is partly consistent with what I was saying about kind of the microscopic market, that you can focus on individuals very inexpensively. And we're going to see more and more of that. OK, let's, um, let's take a break. And what I want to do after we come back from the break is to talk about, <laughs> um, expand this a little more in terms of um, uh, this B2B idea. I'm going to show you a particular idea uh, in terms of FX trading which in 20 years maybe is not uh, going to have much value, but we'll, we'll talk about that. And then we'll kind of continue after that our discussion of asset management and how to position uh, for the future. Let's uh, get started. Um, we had a, a great discussion actually during the break to people who didn't realize that everything is being broadcast. The audio was being broadcast, but it was, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to tell you that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it was really interesting because we were talking about um, you know, just how feasible um, this sort of barter system would be in the future, and it's kind of like, Difficult because um, 
there's all sorts of issues with the goods. Um, you know, how can we certify the quality of the good? You know, if, if you just see it, you don't know what the quality is. Um, and in and many, you know, sort of issues like that. Uh, and what might happen as, as a result of that. I suggest that maybe there would be a separate business group that pops out just in terms of certification. And maybe you could think that consumers would want to pay a fee uh, to make sure that what they're buying is certified by this, uh, this particular company. And then you could also think, well, maybe the consumers wouldn't pay the fee, that the firm would pay the fee because they want to be on the certified list. And even if that happens, um, the cost is going to be a lot less than going through the traditional uh, markets that we go through today with multiple uh, middle people. Okay? And a lot of infrastructure is probably not necessary. So there's lots of possibilities here. And as I said, I, uh, you know, I like brainstorming in the future. Um, and it's, it's a path that, that you need to take. I think it's incredibly important. What we're going to start talking about uh, now is, is something that you actually don't need to certify um, in a sort of B2B idea that there's unquestionable quality of the actual underlying good. And that's like foreign currency. This is not like, uh, like grain that could be of multiple qualities or even a manufactured good where you're not sure. We're talking about the actual currency that um, is traded widely in the market. Indeed, the largest markets in the world um, are currency markets right now with an enormous amount of transaction volume uh, every day. So we're talking multiple times um, what happens in the equity markets trillions of dollars, um, if we want to translate into US dollars, are traded mainly um, through the interbank market. Now, how many, I sent this email around for people that had actually done foreign currency uh, trading on the interbank market. How many people um, have actually done that? Just not as many as I actually uh, anticipated. So, um, what I want to do is to take you through just a, an idea. And it's actually more than just an idea, and I'll get into the details uh, in a little bit. Um, you look at the way that currencies are actually traded. It's, uh, it's a little uh, cumbersome, to say the least, where you're in need of, uh, of buying some euros. And you basically do a phone around. And you phone the investment banks, banks that you've got established credit with. And they will quote you um, some sort of price for it. And that's basically how it works. Now, the investment bank doesn't necessarily have what you want. But they will do the transaction. And then they'll go out and get it. Okay, so Basically, as a result, they're going to be carrying some inventory risk because they're the middle person. And as a result of this risk and as a result of kind of uh, the market structure, they're going to be charging spread. So that spread <coughs> is basically a cost of doing business in this particular business structure. Now, um, you know, I guess uh, I've uh, looked at this market in, in a lot of detail. There's actually a lot of academic research on trading in currency markets, and it's a fascinating uh, topic. And recently, we've got high-frequency data and actually doing that. And it's uh, a very challenging uh, task to study because often transactions are done at the same time by potentially the same client in different locations at different prices. You see that. So you've got a, a firm with operations around the world that are not coordinated centrally. And they're doing currency transactions potentially with the same investment bank at the same instant in time for different prices. 
And I, you know, when I looked at the, those data, um, I started thinking. Um, and when I studied the market a little more, the more I studied it, the more um, it didn't seem sustainable. <laughs> that these spreads that are being charged are big because of this particular risk that's being taken. So I want to get your feedback, uh, I guess, on an idea. And as I said, it's more than an idea. It's actual business plan. <laughs> so it's kind of like the opposite, isn't it? Often the students are presenting the, uh, the, the, uh, the idea for um, assignment number one or, or whatever course you're taking care of. Well, I'm going to do a pitch to you and see what you actually think about this. And I want you to think about this in the context of the discussion that we had earlier on about um, sort of B2B and whether it actually makes sense um, in terms of this particular market. So, so basically, the idea here is to go in and um, create a B2B structure in <coughs> the spot FX market. And I'm going to use the example of FX because it's real simple to use and people are familiar with it. But it actually doesn't just have to be FX. It could be a variety of things in the cash market. Okay. So traditionally, as I said, you know, if you're interested in buying euros, you have to phone around to the banks that you have got established credit lines with. And that's basically um, how it starts. Well, um, there's another possibility, and I've got um, a graph up here of a trading mechanism, a B2B type of mechanism, and let's call it uh, forexter.com, which is actually a real .com that I'm a partner in with um, uh, a PhD student of mine, Armand Glaja. Okay. So what we've got is a B2B method <coughs> that relies upon the idea of a reverse auction. And indeed, this method is, uh, is in process. Um, we've got uh, actually the serial number for uh, the patent application for it. It's highly um, proprietary, and we're uh, in the process of establishing worldwide uh, patent on this. Reverse auction. Do you know what reverse auction actually is? Probably you've done it before, right? Price line like um, idea, where basically um, the client <coughs> goes in and says, um, I'm looking to, to sell or buy um, a million euros for this price. And that goes into the system. And you can also see what the prices are that um, the investment banks are actually um, listing for. And then basically the market is matched directly through this one mechanism. So it's a B2B, so you can um, put kind of a, a second graphic here. Reverse auction. You name the price, and the transaction happens directly. Okay. So this is what we kind of call um, uh, an atomic uh, unit. This is kind of the first part of this business idea. So there's uh, basically out there, a lot of people are, are thinking that the FX market is a market for the taking, for somebody to come in and do something dramatic. And there's other firms that are out there that are doing things. But what they're doing <coughs> is not really that much different than what the market, actually, the fundamental market structure. So you've got firms like FX All that are out there, basically a consortium <coughs> of investment banks that kind of pool together their quotes. It's going to be something way different. Indeed, um, we actually, uh, the name forexter.com is <coughs> no uh, coincidence. Indeed, the way to think about this is the music industry. And um, when you see a firm like amazon.com, start to sell CDs, 
right? And it seems like that's a good idea in the short <coughs> term. But it's basically the same fundamental business model, right? So instead of going to a physical store to buy the CD, you're buying the CD in a different mechanism, and it's being shipped to you. Whereas there's a firm that comes in, like Napster, and fundamentally shakes the structure of the market. What we're doing is coming in and shaking up the structure of the market with this idea that the business method, as I said, is on the route to um, being patented. And indeed, we've got the best uh, law firm, we think, in the world um, that's, uh, that's uh, negotiating um, currently right now. Um, you can, of course, look at this uh, the other way, <coughs> where you've got multiple clients on one side feeding into this uh, <coughs> E2B application using the reverse auction uh, methodology and the financial uh, institution um, is, is actually um, you know, being facilitated via this, uh, this mechanism. So there could be multiple clients of a particular investment bank that are using this methodology to, to deal with the investment bank. And on the other side, there could be multiple investment banks using the B2B platform to deal with the clients. Okay, so a simple way to think about this is the following. We're gonna put all of these modules together. So it could be that you've got an investment bank that is serving its clients with this sort of trading mechanism. And these are the clients that have credit relationships with the investment bank. And then you can think of the investment bank as kind of like a piece in a larger machine <coughs> of this market. So where the investment bank is out there putting the quotes out for other consumers to pick off. So it's two different versions of this, and we kind of call it atomic unit one, atomic unit two. And then you put it all together, and you've got this incredibly elegant training mechanism. And what's going to happen? You really think about <coughs> this um, in terms of uh, the evolution of this particular market. That I want to buy um, like a million euros. And this mechanism allows me to go directly to a person that wants to sell a million euros. In a way, the role of the investment bank changes dramatically. They don't need to carry the inventory. They don't need to bear the inventory risk. And there's no way that they're going to be able to charge the spread because we're basically eliminating that. We're putting the businesses directly to trade. And it's sort of like a barter in a way, except this is really transparent. So the businesses see basically what people are offering to buy. <coughs> you go in, you put your price in, and if it's not hit, then you gotta change your price until it's hit. And then what happens is that two businesses do a transaction. Now, if this transaction, there's still a role for the investment bank, obviously. Um, the investment bank um, basically faci <coughs> facilitates the transaction. And there's a transaction fee, as there is with any uh, currency transaction. And maybe that fee is $25 on a million. <coughs> so that will still exist. But what's not going to exist is the type of spreads that we see today in this market. The spreads are in the range of $100 per month. Okay, and you can justify those spreads by uh, inventory risk and, and other factors, or just you know, the fixed costs of, of the investment bank or the bank. You can justify those spreads uh, in terms of that. But this mechanism, this direct B2B mechanism, it basically eliminates the need to take those types of risk. 
and it eliminates a lot of the fixed costs um, at the particular bank or investment bank. So we're putting consumers, you can think of this as putting consumers directly together. So, so basically what, what we've got, it's more than an idea. We actually have, um, we have the code. And uh, so it's not vaporware, it's code. And actually I will demonstrate this code to you um, where you can actually uh, play with it. Um, I think it's lecture 10 where we do high frequency. So I'll have you actually take a look at the trading interface uh, for, and we're obviously not gonna be trading real uh, money. <laughs> I'll, I'll guarantee you that. Um, but you can actually see how it works. Very elegant. And the key feature of this, that it's not just like one program, it's multiple programs that can be set in motion that kind of talk to each other. So the investment bank can have their, their own version of this that is connected to somebody else's. And all the information is fed together. It's just incredibly uh, powerful um, code. Yes? So what's the incentive that's going to tip these banks to participate in this exchange? Do they need to participate? Well, if I am already making nice spreads, and you're going to tell me that I'm only going to make $25 or a million dollars exchange, and I have no incentive right now to sign up. Right. And especially if there are several banks and you introduce anonymity, then it's very easy to make Right, there's no, it's very transparent. You know who is uh, doing everything. The transparency is really key. So the question you're asking is very similar to the question uh, earlier in the lecture uh, about, you know, are you going to be the challenger or are you going to be the challenged? The, the recording industry basically has sat back and has basically tried to protect their turf, their spread. Because we all know how much it costs to produce, um, you know, a CD-ROM. Well, you bought one for this course, right? Um, and it's a matter of either participate, get in early, be recognized as a leader, or suffer the consequences. Because if you really think about this, the people that are doing these transactions are mainly businesses, right? And what we're doing is putting those businesses together. Actually, I would, uh, if I could interrupt, the barriers to entry are actually lower, and I'll go through the reason. Napster has got a huge <coughs> barrier in that you know, it's in court. Right? It's a legal issue here, whereas we have no legal issues whatsoever. But it's easier to do. I mean, well, okay, I would, uh, okay. Actually, it's not clear that it's easier to do either, because our, um, our code is running right now, and um, we've got um, three hedge funds operational that I'm partnering with that uh, will be using this code um, to trade with various investment banks that have signed up. And this, the one you know, really important advantage um, in what we're proposing is that you don't need large scale to actually make this work. That you can actually start with a smaller scale. Indeed, the people that we thought would most uh, would be most interested initially were kind of like smaller hedge funds that um, just don't do the same amount of business with these banks and investment banks. And um, this is a way for them to get the best possible uh, prices. And um, it, it seems like that's a reasonable uh, thing to do. But I think that the, the, it's okay that uh, I see the, the look of disbelief here. Um, it is true that there's gonna be a lot of investment banks out there that are gonna see this as a massive threat to the way that we're talking about, you know, um, multiple billions of dollars of spreads being eliminated in the future. Okay, so this is a huge threat um, to the way that they actually do business, to put the, the people directly together um, that wanna do the currency trade. And there might be significant resistance it's actually interesting that when we actually go around, um, we thought that people would, um, at banks and investment banks, um, be just incredibly uh, resistant to this idea. 
and we're actually quite shocked that um, there's a number that are, are quite open to the idea because they see the writing on the wall. They know that this is not sustainable in the future. They got to do something. And there's still a way to make a lot of money in doing this. So, you know, I guess we're in discussion with, um, you know, strategic partners that recognize that this is the future, whether they like it or not, either they're going to be on board or they're not on board. And the actual cost of doing this is, uh, is not that large given that it's scalable. Is that come close to, I, I don't mean to 100% convince you because you've just seen like two slides, but it, it's, uh, but it is kind of consistent with what we've been talking about. Yeah, but remember, the people that we want to sign up are often just like corporations that are, are doing business, that, that have to do the phone around to the seven investment banks that know that they're being charged the spread, right? What we're offering is, well, you can still do that if you want, but also take a look at the, at the prices um, that are available on our system. And if you don't like them, fine. But I think that there's a real possibility if you, re if you eliminate that spread, which is the largest cost in actually doing the, the currency other than the time to do the phone around. If you take that spread out, then um, it's going to significantly make that market more efficient. Yes? The Toronto Bank, getting back to the incentive question, <coughs> and I think that things are sort of going to commoditize anyway, and I move first, essentially <coughs> moving first, and my, my competitors are reaping the higher prices from the top, from that time until it completely commoditizes. So, are you thinking of any exclusivity? I mean, are there only a certain no. number of people who can get on board? Or no, actually, it's it's, uh, it's best the you know, the, you know, there's, I guess, a number of different business models. There's like an equity partner at the beginning, who, you know, if you, if you do the projection, it's not too hard to do. Even the, there would be a fee that we would charge also, but it'd be trivial, um, three dollars, not a hundred. Um, but if you, if you do projections like that, then there could be an equity partner and it could be a, a number of uh, strategic uh, partners there. But I think maybe what you're getting at is the people that are actually using this system, right? And you'd want actually to have um, a range of, uh, of banks and investment banks and, um, and, and the actual businesses that, that are doing this. So it's a huge demand. We've chosen to focus initially on small hedge funds because we know that you know, they are the smaller clients and they can't get good prices and they can't afford the spread. They can't do the high frequency trading because of the transactions costs and we can offer them something to reduce those costs. So yeah, it, it's kind of like, um, if, if you think about it, there's a real strategy <coughs> issue here. Um, do you go with a financial partner or a strategic partner? Uh, I think you were first, Sean. Um, a couple of like one point in the question. The question is, who absorbs the credit risk in terms of the transaction between the two counts? Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, okay. Um, it, it's like, um, it's like, why is it different? Why would it be any different using this type of system than the going through the investment bank? The investment bank or the bank would still do the the transaction cost, right? <coughs> so do you go? So would you? Both counterparties have to have an account with a particular of investment course. bank to have a credit. Sure, and, that, and that's bank. exactly how it happens today. So we're not really changing that particular part of the model. All we're doing is eliminating you know, a lot of the inventory risk and the extra profit that is associated with the spread. Because we can put people together more efficiently. So it's a person, as I said, the person that um, wants to buy the euros is hooked to the person that wants to sell the euros directly. You don't have to carry anything. There's no risk. In, in, but all the counterparty risk and all those issues um, are exactly the same as <coughs> what would occur in the traditional market. And then the, the other point was more um, currently there are like bro brokerage systems that work like Reuters and EBS, which yes. exchange could be basically two banks sign up and right. each bank allocates ca uh, credit lines to certain banks within right. that system. So it's going to operate more or less in the same way as that? No, because uh, what we're talking about, and we know what these other systems are, these other systems are not. Um, they don't have the same structure, they don't have the reverse auction feature. There's other markets um, that have kind of reverse auction features, but um, in a lot of these cash markets, 
this is not replicated um, in terms of um, what we're offering. Remember, we've got this system that's running, that could be serving the clients of the bank. And then there's this other level where the clients are going into a particular system. And you've got all these atoms that are talking to each other. It's nothing like uh, what's in the market or any of the startups that we've seen with um, sort of business proposals. I guess I don't understand the concept of the reserve, reverse auction then because if- Name your price. Right. And I know yeah, what you're saying, and that's Reuters- like a market maker right. within the EBS system. Or right, yeah, and to a smaller extent. But, but what it isn't, it, it's like one screen, basically. And what we've got is these multiple units uh, running the reverse auctions. It's, it's a much different model. I, indeed, uh, it, it's, uh, it's so different that uh, Fenwick and West uh, uh, believes that uh, it's going to be very easy to secure the patent on the map. And they certainly know what, uh, what these other systems are. The, the intellectual property, of course, is the main thing we have to protect. And uh, do people know Fenwick and West? They're like um, Silicon Valley uh, top notch people. Yes? I had a discussion in one of the previous classes last term about Napster, Nutella, and and so on. So <coughs> we, were, we were discussing whether those types of services have a sustainable business model or whether they're inherently lost in this because the marginal cost of matching up two people who want to exchange something is zero, effectively. So not to say that Forex Star couldn't survive in the short run by charging a lower spread in the established banks, but in the long run, if the marginal cost of matching up clients um, who want to exchange financial goods is effectively zero, and what's to stop competition from promoting away even that twenty-five dollars per million dollars down to nothing? Yeah, the twenty-five. Remember, the twenty-five goes to the the bank, okay, to facilitate the transaction to take into account some of the things that uh, Sean was mentioning. Um, the the three-dollar fee, let's say, um, is basically just a payment to four extra, okay. And I'm not. I guess you can consider it a cost, just like a spread is a cost, but it's you know. Um, way less than what currently exists today. Now, what you're saying is, is there a possibility in the future, because the marginal cost is effectively zero? And it is true. You know, we've got, we've got the code. You know, I'm going to show you code that is incredibly elegant um, and, and, and unique. So it's there. So is there a chance that somebody else is going to come in with a similar business idea yeah, that's always the case in doing a startup, and that's why we got the best lawyers in the world uh, for intellectual property. And they believe that we have an extremely strong case. Okay, so somebody could come in, but it's not going to be exactly what we've got. Will it be close? You know, it, it's hard to, hard to tell. It seems that uh, in kind of going around that, um, that people have not really progressed that far in, in the way that they're, they're thinking about this. So we're going to be the first in. And it's highly scalable because our costs are very low. So we can start out very small. And we'll have some business immediately. We know that. And we're talking very uh, distinguished firms uh, <coughs> about this that are very large, that are willing to sign up um, potentially as uh, a strategic partner or actually use the, uh, the system. And what you're saying is, in the longer term, somebody else is going to come in and force down the um, force down that three dollars to the three cents. Maybe you know <laughs> when we do our forecasting, that's that's a possibility. But within that span of today to ten years, there's a lot of value that's going to be created. Okay, and the value that I'm talking about is not just value in our pockets, which is significant also, <laughs> um, but think about what it means for the market. Like this is uh, what we call, um, in, in, in economics, something that improves uh, the, the welfare of the people actually doing the business. And it is true, as you said, that the, uh, the banks that have been charging the spread that will not be able to do that in the future, they're going to take a hit. There's no doubt. If they 
are involved with this project, maybe that's going to compensate. But, uh, but it just seems to me inevitable. You know, we talk about the 7% uh, fee for the IPO. You know, you know that's, you know, I, I said that's going to go away or be reduced. And I think that's obvious also. But that IPO's, you know, the investment bank plays a role in certain the quality. You know, <coughs> go with a certain investment bank that means something. In this particular business idea, it's, it's currency. There's no question of what we're actually dealing with. And all of the credit risk issues have been taken care of already. Yes? Yes, uh, but uh, one of the things that financial institutions has is a big, they're <coughs> regulated by governments and central banks, uh, <coughs> specifically with, with big issues like money laundering and, and, and all these things. How the central banks and the governments are going to play a role in, uh, in determining, uh, in defining a, a barrier of entries or just anyone just go there and put in you know, a web page to do these kind of transactions? Oh, okay. Well, first, you know, there is, like, there are laws that exist, international laws, and you can protect, um, you know, intellectual property on an in international basis. It is possible that somebody um, sets up a business and a country that hasn't signed on to various international conventions, but you know, who's really going to do business with that entity offshore if you're onshore? So if you're based in New York, let's say, you're going to be hard pressed to be doing business with somebody that you know violates um, international law or hasn't signed on. Uh, it usually just doesn't happen. Um, so, but that you know, it's obviously very important. You need to go and and protect the, as much as you can your intellectual property. And that's certainly been our main effort right now uh, is the intellectual property issue. But can a, a name of a bank, uh, can, I, uh, can, I, can a bank actually charge for the name of the bank if you're doing the transaction? Okay, remember how it works, that the, the bank would still uh, retain the transaction fee. Okay, and that's how it works today. And the transaction fee would take into account all of these other factors. So the actual infrastructure that's necessary um, is no different than what it is today. The only difference is that we are putting together the buyer and seller directly. Okay, and, and effectively the, the investment bank or the bank tries to do this also, right? They know, well, somebody's selling this and somebody else is buying, they're kind of like doing it on the fly. And other times, they're taking some risk uh, in terms of their inventory. But we just have an efficient way to do that because the investment bank is dealing kind of with its client base. Right? Once I put these pieces together, then the base becomes, you know, eventually clients that are not necessarily their clients but somebody else's clients. It could be governments, whatever. Uh, there, anybody that needs to do a transaction and currency could be using this, and it's all fed together, and the best possible prices are obtained. Yes? Why would you need more than one bank in a system like that, then? I mean, basically all they're doing is sort of a commoditized process of the clearing process. It's a, it's a, it, I think a brilliant question. And, and I think <laughs> that the people that are looking at this particular um, model are asking the same question. So why do I want to be involved? That's you're looking at. You, I'm really pushing you to think of the future here. You know, so here, you know, the foreign currency kind of trading um, that happens in banks and investment banks is a very profitable part of their business. And what happens if you take that away and then start asking questions like you're asking, like, you know, how does this impact, with other things obviously, the structure of kind of banking in the future? I would certainly, uh, I would certainly be stressed out about that if I was a senior person that was kind of watching this unfold. You've got to be not watching, you've got to be great involved. Yes, Russell? If the bank is the legitimate entity in the transaction, why does the system need to be closed? Why not just have an open portal? Why do you have to be signed on? Just have a web page and, oh, I've got 100 million euros. It's basically what's going to happen. 
basically what's going to happen. That we're going to, and that's what you're going to do. I'm going to give you a web address at www.forexter.com, uh, right? And you're going to go into this system. And this system eventually will be communicating with these other um, nodes and, and organizing all the information. There's no real difference to that system as buying a share on E-Trade or Whatever. I mean, I don't know if I'm buying from. Well, okay, but that's, that's really interesting <laughs> because, there right, because if you look at the, the actual equity markets, uh, you've got things like market orders and limit orders. You, you know, and you, you can actually uh, do that. Now, you're transacting through, um, uh, through a broker, correct? You're not transacting directly with the company. Okay, but you do have some of these mechanisms where you put uh, sort of limit order in there, and it kind of looks familiar uh, in terms of what we're talking about. So there are some other markets with reverse auction formats, so a price line uh, for consumers. So as I say, part of what we're doing is that, which doesn't exist currently uh, in the form that we're proposing in the, in the FX market. And the idea is, of course, that your corporation um, you're going to log into this site and see what's available. <coughs> and initially, it's going to be, um, you're going to be doing the phone around also. Can I get a better price um, with uh, these particular investment banks? Or what does it say on the internet? What and I can hit directly. It, I don't see the difference. What's part of that system as with E-Trade? It's the same concept. We're not trading um, you know, uh, 500 million uh, euros uh, on E-Trade. Right. Okay, and, and there's another fundamental difference here, okay? Because in the model that we're kind of talking about here, uh, the, anal the analogy for equity markets is for you almost to be trading um, with other people directly. So there'd be no, there'd be, there'd be no entity like E-Trade. You would be trading, like we would be trading directly and bypassing all the commissions. Okay, now you've seen the commissions also go down as a result of technology. I think it's very similar as to what's going to happen in the foreign currency market. The equity markets have been you know, moving out in front. But <coughs> today, the system is you've got an exchange. And people trade on the exchange. And there's all sorts of rules for crossing trades. Um, and, and there's a lot of structure that basically um, adds to the cost of trading. I believe in the future that we're not going to have, as I said earlier, the New York Stock Exchange as it exists. That it's going to be people trading with other people. There's going to be some mechanism to facilitate that. There are people that are already proposing exchanges like this. What we're doing is going to the cash market, not the equity market, with this proprietary system that kind of links all these programs together. And uh, it is different. You know, the model, I, you know, I'm biased, of course. Um, it, it just makes so much sense to me. It's going to happen. If you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And is it possible that somebody can just come in? This is you know multi-trillion dollar market. Is it possible that somebody can come in um, that is small and make this thing win? Absolutely. And that's where you look at an example like Napster. Though they've got their own problems, as I said. They were able to challenge the structure of a very large and profitable market. And I don't know how it's going to actually turn out, but it doesn't matter. It's just that <coughs> model of, of challenging. <coughs> so it helps that it's, you know, that we do have these three hedge funds running already, so we've got immediate business uh, for this type of system. Um, and um, you know, I, I think that the scalability is also <coughs> another huge advantage. They don't have these fixed costs. They can start out small. People could be looking to do the phone around also, but it just seems to make a, a lot of sense. Yes? When the system reaches critical mass, I'm curious to find out uh, what would happen if somebody is raiding a currency, like what happened in Malaysia a few years back and so on. Would it actually uh, lessen those effects or create a ripple effect as such? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, the you know, it's going to be, um, you would think it'd be a little more transparent. Uh, but again, you know, if it's uh, a bank or investment bank with their name on, on the quote, 
or the price, like taking the price. You actually don't know who's behind that. You don't know if it's George Soros uh, you know, or, or whoever, right? So you don't have complete transparency and actually who's doing the trading. Uh, as to the volatility of the movements, I'm not sure it makes any difference. We're just more efficiently putting, um, putting people together. And there's a actual academic research <coughs> on efficiency and volatility. Hey, let me give you that pitch. It's very short. Uh, the papers are not short, but the pitch is very short. That in an efficient market uh, where transactions costs are extremely low, prices adjust very quickly or immediately to information. In an inefficient market, it takes a while for prices to adjust, and indeed, they might overshoot and oscillate until they, until they actually um, get to where they should be. So you can think of an inefficient market as these kind of like slow movements. Maybe you overshoot a bit, and then you oscillate to get to the price. Whereas in the efficient market, you've got sharp moves. Given the information comes in, you move immediately. Okay, so, so it turns out that um, in the efficient market, it might look a little more volatile. And it's more volatile because the prices are, are better prices getting better prices. And that's where um, this literature, where kind of like everybody's better off. The corporations are definitely better off in getting a better price for that currency. Okay? It's, it's, it's more accurately reflecting um, the information. Um, now, the downside, of course, is that if information comes in, and it's very important information, you're going to see <coughs> big, sharp moves, uh, either down or up. It's not going to be slow. It's going to be fast. But um, you know, so so there could be some increased volatility. That's true. <coughs> but overall, you're getting better prices. So in a way, you could uh, phrase the question: um, There's a level of volatility that's the efficient <coughs> level of volatility. It reflects the information. Okay, and that's basically what you're going to get. And it might be greater or smaller than what it is today. But as I say, there's no reason that uh, different organizations, uh, you know. Uh, Pension funds have investments uh, overseas. They do currency hedging. They know basically what they have to do. Um, uh, you know, government organizations, whatever, uh, with their their national accounts, they're they're in these markets all the time. And it just seems like this is, at minimum, another way to do business. Let's see see what happens. Yes. Does it have to be currencies? It seems like this would be applied to corporate bonds or treasuries. Or yeah, basically anything in the, um, the cash market right now. And indeed, our, our business plan is uh, more general than currencies, but it's always best to focus on something that is really highly tangible. And you know, the currency is just like sitting out there with like a target sign on them. Because right? everybody knows it's huge profit. And everybody knows they've seen these other markets. Like you've seen E-Trade and, and some other uh, electronic markets, what they can do. This is just for the taking. So yeah, uh, but we have to be focused, right? You can't do everything at once. And the patent that, uh, that uh, we've got the serial number for um, actually is more general than, than currencies. Definitely more general. <coughs> Yes. Isn't there a relationship component to the corporation and the bank in that maybe not on the foreign exchange, but if I give them my foreign exchange business, they'll represent me in a public offering or something? And isn't there some weighing that the corporation has to do there? Yeah, so there's other things. And you always have to consider these other things. So when you do business with the investment bank, the investment bank is looking at the transaction not just as a one-off <coughs> transaction, that there's other things that are actually going on between the client and the investment bank that could add value uh, for both the corporation and the investment bank. And basically what we're doing is stripping out um, you know, their spread or greatly reducing it and leaving them with something, obviously the transaction fee, which is you know, substantial. And would this, uh, would this affect um, the other stuff that they're doing? And, and I guess the way that I look at that is that this is going to happen anyways. So it's not like any particular corporation's fault. Like, are they going to transact for $3 or are they going to transact for 100 in terms of the fee? They, they can't justify to their shareholders 
the hundred dollars when they could do it for three. So it's going to happen anyways, and I think that the bank and the investment bank will have to look at different ways uh, of actually creating value. This one it is going to be gone. So uh, you know, you, t you talk about uh, the bank maybe underwriting um, you know an equity offering and, and things like that. Again, that one I, I don't think is sustainable in the long term either. There's going to be a different way to do that. We offer the equity directly to the consumers. Forget the exchange. So can the investment bank or the bank actually get into that business? There's actually a whole literature in banking on what the efficient size of a bank is. And it's amazing literature because some people say, you know, like seven clients and other people say one bank. So it's like all over the place. But they're gonna have to look at those things, like what, what is my competitive advantage, what is the future landscape likely to look at, and actually do what we do in project evaluation, do crystal ball kind of stuff, go through that exercise, follow the paths, and figure out how can I be a winner on these paths. And, and, and I don't want to get ahead of myself too much because this is exactly what we talk about when we do that, um, the case, uh, it's <coughs> called the Shadow Whistler uh, case, actually. That's what I did when I met uh, Mundell. Um, and it's a matter of strategy. What we're talking about, in a way, <coughs> is strategy. Like you've done the strategy course, right? Or it's required course now, or almost. Done the strategy course. And really what we're talking about in strategy, you know, the most important thing is you establish the goals. And then you've got a strategy to try to achieve those goals. And in developing the strategy, you have to go through you know, a lot of hopes, competitive analysis, the future landscape, all of this stuff. And we know, you, know, you don't need um, you know, an MBA from, from Duke University to realize that if there's a segment that's making a huge profit, <laughs> that that's not sustainable in the face of uh, technological change. And it's not just the FX uh, uh, cash market, uh, you can go through history and see what actually happens. And that's why I believe history is very important. Look at the evolution of, of business through time and the forces that cause business to change. You can learn a lot from that. And we don't have a course, I don't think, in sort of corporate history, but that would be a course that I think would be um, really enlightening because it gives you kind of the foundation to think forward to think into the future. So here's a situation where we've got specific technological capability. The internet facilitates this. You know, there's code in the background that's very elegant and, and proprietary, but the internet facilitates this idea of having these units uh, basically talk to each other and provides a new business model. And in asset management in general, it, it's definitely the case that, you know, when I think about, um, when I was at this uh, brainstorming session in Boston, and it was sponsored by, uh, you know, a, a very uh, well-known um, firm that does investment management, you know, they were basically asking the same sort of questions that we would ask in kind of a, a strategy class. And so what are the strengths and the weaknesses? What is the competitive environment today? What are the technological forces that we can actually have some ability to forecast? You know, for example, people just get out broadband, right? And we can see that in the future, the speed um, to which you get stuff off the internet is gonna increase dramatically. So what does that mean for, um, for uh, you know, the cable TV industry? What does it mean for, for movies? Like, it will be possible. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense to forecast that we won't have fiber uh, connections, you know, in houses. You see the fiber pipes being laid all over the place. Right now, we've got fiber um, going directly to New York for this digital video. You know, and it, it is incredibly fast. Right, where instantly you can download the digital video for a two hour movie. Okay. That is just going to exist.
coaxial cable? You gotta be kidding. Like that is not a long-term uh, viable um, you know, method. Or copper telephone lines, there's no way. Maybe with satellite they can make some technological advances, but currently it's just not viable. To me, fiber, that's it. And what does that mean for television as we know it, for, for audio? Uh, these are like dramatic things, and these are not difficult to forecast. Okay, we did the forecasting for the computer speed. We could also do it for the bandwidth. Actually, I've got data on that too. <laughs> Uh, for bandwidth, and we, we know the speed of the fiber. It's just a matter of laying it. So you see this stuff coming, and this is kind of like the exercise and strategy where you look at not just the competitive landscape today, but the landscape of the future. And then you figure out the moves that you can take to maximize value. Yes? How does this project match with what we talked about uh, one hour ago regarding the fact that we are moving toward a unit of account, which is yeah. no more currency. Right, yeah, that, uh, that seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? But it, this course is maybe filled with things that seemingly um, appear to be contradictory. So I'm saying that I believe we'll go to three currency zones like very quickly if we're not there already, right, effectively. Okay, so that that effectively means that the trading that's going to take place in currencies is going to be limited. Okay, the bulk is going to take place, um, you know, dollar euro, dollar yen, basically. Maybe something else like pound, Swiss franc is going to hang out there for a while. Um, so, you know, that's what it's going to look like in the shorter term. The one currency world, in my estimate, this is being recorded, I guess, so I'll have to live by it. I think we're a while off for that, and maybe it's going to be as much as 20 years. Somebody said at the, at the break that it took 20 years to get the currency union in Europe. And, and I said, well, we should be careful about a linear extrapolation of that, because there are forces that you know, are changing that are, uh, that are making things happen a lot faster. But, because of the issue of sovereignty, I think that uh, it's going to be a while. So there's going to be some time before <coughs> we actually get to a single unit of account. Okay? And once we get to that single unit of account, then it's clear that this FX idea um, applied to FX is not going to work because there's no demand for it. But we got a lot of value to, to harvest uh, from now to 20 years. And the idea, I think you can see that the idea is much more general. So, um, so I think that uh, you know, you're right to, to push the thinking that way. But there's a lot that can be uh, done in the shorter term. You know, we're talking like uh, shorter term, but uh, it, you know, for a lot of us, the short term is like next year. Or 18 months, it's the average time for your first job. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it, and often you don't get the chance to do this. You know? and, and it's actually, it's great to do it here because it's going to be a while uh, before you're in a position, hopefully sooner rather than later because we need to build the endowment at Fugle, um, <laughs> where you're sitting down and strategizing about the, the future landscape and, and the strategic moves that your firm is going to make <coughs> to try to um, create value. What are we going to do? So in asset management, um, just like, in, in one thing that hopefully I've made transparent here, asset management is no different than any other industry here, right? Technology is impacting all these industries. And some are gonna change faster than others. And actually we can learn from other industries and how, the, how they've actually changed. So asset management is just as vulnerable as any other industry, indeed, um, one industry that uh, people often don't think of that much, especially here, is the education industry. And I talked about that last time. Where it's going it's to be uh, a big shakeout. It doesn't make any sense the way it's structured right now. And once you're kind of entrenched here, 
And our, our structure is different from <coughs> tenure and all that, so you've got a job for, for life, uh, so to speak. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to, to look forward. You know, why should I do that? I've got a job, security. But if, if the people at the university don't do this, they're going to be shaken out. So it's the same in any industry. And asset management is, is no different. Indeed, I think that um, it's the case that, uh, that we haven't seen as much in asset management. We've seen a lot of transactional change with the E-trades, Daytac online and things like that. So we've seen sort of tra transactional business and we've seen the commissions for equity trading you know, diminish significantly. We've got all these markets out there. The bond market is in, is in the dark ages. To get a price on a bond is extremely difficult. It's not that much trading other than kind of well-known issues. Yet the bond market is an incredibly deep market uh, in terms of the actual amount of debt out there in the economy. And something's going to happen there. And just the way that you service um, and, and create value, what you need to do, and we only have uh, a couple of minutes left, what you need to do is to sit down at the particular firm and figure out what is your core competency. And if you don't have one, either you get one quickly or you look to, to dump your own position. You have, you know, and I think that that is something that sounds obvious to you. You, you know, in strategy 101, it's like question <coughs> one, what is the core competency? That's exactly the first question that needs to be asked when you're doing kind of asset management strategy. Second question is, is that competency at risk in the future? The third thing is, how can I sustain it in a consistent way? And what actions do I take today to actually do that? So to do what I'm suggesting, you know, we've only touched the surface of this and we're gonna kind of revisit this later in the course because I, I think it's so fundamental. I can show you, and I will show you, you're gonna be really sick of this, drawing the, the mean variance frontier and how to, you're doing it in assignment number two, how to get the weights, the best weights for your portfolio. But this stuff is kind of the, the mechanical implementation of a business. And you need to take yourself a step back and think about the sustainability of that business in the longer term. And that's why I think strategy is so important. You know, asset management is not just about you know, rocket science and matrix algebra, differential equations, neural nets. That stuff is important, but it needs to be viewed in context. The big picture is the most important. And it's an ultra top-down sort of, sort of approach. What am I doing now? It's adding value, yes. But is that going to be sustainable in the future? Those are fundamental questions that we have to ask in asset management if indeed we want to create, create the value for the shareholders. OK, so that's where we are. So next lecture. Um, we'll change track a little bit and, uh, and talk about strategic asset allocation. I want you to think in particular about your view over the next five years. I know you're thinking about it right now in terms of assignment number two. But think about your view as to what you think the US market and the world market is going to actually perform over the, next, um, over the next three to five years. I'm going to be asking specifically about that. Yes. Okay.